Hello everyone, today we're going to look at two games between Gary Kasparov with the white pieces and uh, Bent Larson with the black pieces. The first game comes from uh, Tilburg 1981. Gary had the white pieces, Larson the black pieces once again. So D4, Knight of 6, C4, D6, Knight C3, E5. This is... Uh, Type of Indian defense that you really don't see nowadays uh, called the old Indian defense and the only difference between the old Indian defense and the quote-unquote uh, Kings Indian defense is just the placement of this dark uh, square Bishop right here on f8 of course in the modern Kings Indian defense the Bishop goes on um, the g7 square but in the old Indian it goes on e7 many masters deem uh, that the bishop's placement is uh, more valuable and effective in the game on g7 so uh, modern practice has shifted to um, uh, to a point where you would see more games with this bishop on uh, fiend kettled on uh, g7 Ben Larson back in the 70s and uh, 80s uh, was uh, a specialist in this in this line with the black pieces so if you are interested in this opening in particular I uh, suggest you study uh, some of the games of Bent Larson uh, he had some pretty good results with it uh, this the game that you get is pretty solid right you're not gonna get the most active game like you would get in a, a Kings a regular Kings Indian um, but it takes a lot of skill, patience, and handling, and sometimes you will find yourself in some um, dubious positions. Uh, I noticed some of the games I looked at, Larson was in quite a bit of trouble. He would miraculously get out, but some games were pretty solid, um, and some games he just got uh, crushed, uh, period. Uh, he would make a blunder or something like that and just get crushed, so it's de it definitely requires a delicate a uh, hand uh, and due to the cramped nature of some of the positions you really can't afford a lot of um, uh, mistakes with the black pieces that's that's what it is uh, so that led to some of his uh, uh, quick losses so back to the game here we see the bishop on e7 e3 from Kasparov castle queen c2 c6 we see the slow build up by uh, black in order to contest the center and what he's going to do is play this idea with a6 and b5 to just start chipping away and uh, the white uh, space advantage on the queen side what i like about this opening is it is very solid with the black pieces you get the early uh, uh, strong point on e uh, e5 but again it's not a lot of great prospects but very uh solid opening and doesn't um have a lot of theory associated with it h6 and Kasparov plays h4 here so this is young Kasparov a very aggressive uh, player Larson just simply continues with his plan on b5 um, the idea here is, is if Larson takes h takes g5 the knight goes back to e8 and you can see the problem here after bishop h7 check king h8 bishop to g8 check for example King takes and Queen H7 mate. So Kasparov is not uh, not playing here. All right. So it's a real threat. Larson just simply goes on with his plan with B5. Now, another idea is just taking the center. Keeping with the old idea that the best remedy for a flank attack is an attack in the center. So E takes D4. Let's say knight takes d4, and then just simply knight c5, unraveling a bit. Bishop f5, and then let's say bishop d7, for example. And um, black is just fine. And then the next stage of black's plan will be working on seeing if he can achieve this advance. d5, just slowly uh, unraveling, and hopefully leaving, uh, uh, hopefully, uh, you know, provoking white to uh, leave some weaknesses uh, along the way for an end game. Larson, however, played b5, undermining the white center. D takes, knight takes, 
And if you could get uh, White to uh, relinquish his uh, central influence like this, D takes E5, Knight takes E5, Knight takes, uh, Black has no problems. So Black is um, good in the open, out of the opening here. He has basically exactly what he wanted. Um, but Kasparov has um, um, very aggressive intentions uh, in mind. And you'll see why he decided to open up the a position here at this point. There it is. Castle and queen side. Even with the black pawns being slightly advanced on the queen side. He doesn't see a danger here. Larson plays queen a5. King b1. Bishop e6. And you can see the black pieces just come to life immediately uh, as they have been given more space after the exchange. So it's very double-edged decision by uh, Kasparov to open uh, open up the game uh, and take away the uh, uh, cramped nature of the black position by playing D takes E5. Because you see after the exchange, white uh, has lost his influence in the center by losing that pawn on D4. And now black has the room to just immediately activate his pieces. Kasparov removes a defender from the king side. Bishop takes f6. Bishop takes f6. And now knight e4. Attacking. Bishop e7. And now knight g5 from Kasparov. Similar intentions. Right? If uh, this knight is captured. But it's also threatening to um, destroy black's pawn structure here by capturing the bishop. Larson. <clears throat> Excuse me. Larson seeing the danger plays B takes C4. So he wants to uh, get on with his attack. Uh, one general principle in these uh, opposite wing uh, attack situations is usually uh, pawns and pieces uh, will be sacrificed because uh, it becomes a matter of who gets the initiative first, right? The one who gets to the king first is going to win. So. Um, many times players will throw caution to the wind, um, pawn structures will be compromised, pieces will be hanging, pawns uh, will be sacrificed, right, in order to uh, uh, attack the opponent's king. The only caveat here is that if the attack does not succeed, then you might have a lot of weakness uh, to pick up, right, or defend uh, in the end. So that's the chance you're taking, as you can see with these two um, pawns on the C file, right? Larson's uh, uh, pawns could be weak in the, uh, in the potential ending if he doesn't mate uh, Gary here. So again, Larson played B takes C4. If he takes the knight here, same combination as before. Bishop H7, check. King H8, H takes G5, and you can see the H file being opened up. And let's say G6, for example. Bishop takes G6, check. King G7, rook H7, check. And the, this is just a sample line, but you can see that the black king would be doomed. So back to the game. After knight G5, Larson did not fall for the bait. And instead, started attacking on the queen side. Kasparov did not want to uh, play bishop takes uh, c4 is now because now Larson can take the piece right it looks dangerous but he can take it and what he would have to do here is shut down this um, b1 to uh, h7 diagonal by sacrificing this pawn now with e4 <clears throat> now if queen takes e4 then just simply bishop F5 winning, as you can see, the bishop is pending the queen to the king. So, after B takes C4, this is why um, Kasparov did not take. So, instead, he plays bishop H7 check, king H8, and now he just simply comes here. So, the, the idea is uh, still alive. So, this knight is not going to be taken. So instead, Kasparov wants the initiative, so he creates a threat here. So bishop takes, queen takes, threatening mate. So bishop g5, h takes g5, 
and rook a b8 so dangerous looking position here um it looks like kasparov is just a few moves uh from checkmate here he plays rook to c1 of course if he tries to uh haste and uh Open up the king side here with G takes H6. Then Larson has a fantastic move himself. Again, like I was saying, in these opposite wing attacks, um, piece um, pieces are sacrificed, pawns are sacrificed. Caution is thrown to the wind many times. It's about who gets to the king first. And this move right here would win if Kasparov played the move um, G takes H6. All right, and these opposite wing uh, situations, just know that uh, in general, it's going to be the dynamic features of the position, right, that will override your more static or positional features. So here, you're not worried about double pawns, backward pawns, uh, those uh, static features. You're worried more about the dynamic features, piece activity, right, uh, open files and diagonals, right. Things along that nature. So this would win right here for uh, Larson if Kasparov hastily tried to rip open the king side with G takes h6. Rook takes b2. Check. King takes b2. Rook b8. And you can see the king is laid bare. So instead Kasparov just simply play Rook c1 here. And of course now the combination no longer going to work and then white would just simply tuck his queen away king away i'm sorry as there is no queen c3 and that's the purpose of rook c1 so after rook a b8 rook c1 larson looking to continue the threats right they're fighting for the initiative queen d2 threatening mate of course, Kasparov will not be mated. Rook c2. Larson plays queen d3, attacking the queen. So what he wants to do is simply uh, neutralize the attack and straighten out his pawns and create a pass pawn on top of that. So Larson is trying to basically have his cake and eat it too. He wants to attack, but also be uh, set up for a good end game if the attack doesn't work out. So, for example, if Kasparov, again, was a lesser player and played queen takes d3 and just simply c takes d3. And yeah, rook takes c6 uh, for white is good, but this pawn right here is nice. And maybe after trading off uh, a pair of rooks, rook takes c8, rook takes c8, and let's just say rook d1. E4 is annoying. And of course, you know, you had this battle F3, H takes G3, etc., etc. But um, you can see the the game will start to drift in uh, Black's favor here. So Kasparov plays the move G4 instead. So he's not going to, uh, you know, help Black out here. Black has two weak pawns. Uh, on the C file, he's not going to, to help him out with that. He plays G4. Queen takes F5. G takes F5. So Larson um, trades the queens off. And this position to me is uh, favorable for white. Uh, the pawns of black, um, pawn structure of black is not uh, too good. And the pawns on the C file are easy to attack. Also, the H file is open. Uh, the pawn and then h6 is pinned. But Larson is known as a great fighter. And let's see how, how he did. So he played the move rook b4. So he just decided to protect these uh, bad pawns on the c file. Um, so Kasparov played rook h4. Now he could have just captured the pawn on h6 this probably is the best uh scenario i can't really see what what black can do here after this rook takes h6 that's obviously bad so 
Say so after rook d8. H takes g7, king takes g7. And I see white still being better, although the win is very far, far off. It's a kind of a difficult position, needs some time to, to analyze. I don't even know if H takes g7 uh, was correct right there. Maybe an in-between move like a3, but I'm not, not sure. We'll t take further analysis for sure. But my instinct is telling me that white is definitely um, is better, not not by a whole lot, but definitely better, just because of the the pawn the pawn situation, the pawn structure. So Kasparov played rook h4 instead of capturing here. Larson played rook d8, right, taking over the d file. Nice move. Um, being active is good when you have. Uh, structural weaknesses you always want to uh balance the dynamic features with the static features uh if you can right especially and especially if you're if one side is worse than the other so if you're uh you know have bad pawn structure or a lot of weak squares you want to be active and um uh dynamic with with your piece play in order to uh make up for those weaknesses here it is, so a3 from Kasparov, rook, rook a4, and now he takes g takes, g6, by Larson, f takes, f takes, rook h, c4, so it just looks like um, Kasparov has just picked up some material, and now he's up, he's up a pawn, but it looks like that h pawn uh, on h6 was going to fall eventually the problem here for white though is that he has four excuse me for black that he has four separate uh, four isolated pawns and that's kind of brutal and you can see all the pressure that Kasparov is placing on these pawns rook e7 rook a6 just working uh, Larson here rook c7 and now the king comes to the center from Kasparov king h7 King d3, rook f7. So Larson trying to get a little bit of counterplay here by attacking the f2 pawn. And Kasparov decides to just keep going, forging ahead. He could have played, he could have tried, um, you know, played a move like king uh, e2. But it's a little on the passive side. All right. But... I don't see anything wrong wrong with it. I mean, maybe Rook C7 from Larson at this point. Right, if Larson is going to be passive also. But I don't think anything was wrong so much with this move. But if anything, it shows like that, you know, Kasparov still was working um, on being more patient here. Right, he didn't, I'm sorry, at this time in his career, he wasn't, he wasn't as patient. Um, like I, I think Karpov would have played a move like King E2, or maybe even, maybe even uh, like A4 or something. But anyway, King E4 was played. So Rook takes F2, Rook takes A7 check, King takes H6, and now B4 pushing the pawns. G5 and G5 is the only source of counterplay. I'm sorry, not G5. The G pawn is uh, Black's really only source of counterplay in the position, right? Since he has a, a outside pass pawn, that is going to be the um, salvation for Black if he can make it work, right? There's no the E pawn is probably going to drop and the C pawn is probably going to drop. So the G pawn is basically the um, you know the last gasp. Uh, for black here so Kasparov continues his attack he wins the other pawn now Larson tries to stay active he plays rook to a2 and here's where it gets uh gets really uh uh critical in this position Kasparov plays the move rook to c1 here now g4 king takes e5 now rook takes a3, king a f4, rook b3, rook c5 check, king h4 from Larson, 
threatening mate with rook c8 from Kasparov. Rook takes b4 check, e4, king h3, rook h8 check, king g2, king, <laughs> g, g2 rook g8, and now king h3. And guess what? The game was drawn. So I know some of you are surprised. Like, wow, how, how it looked like Kasparov was just clearly winning. He definitely had an advantage. Now I'm going back here. And I know I told you I will show you two games, and I am, but I'm just going to go back real quick to this move. Rook c1, Kasparov played. He had a few other choices here. One was um, just rook a6, <clears throat> defending, right? Keeping the, the uh, pass pawn duel, duel intact. So g4, for example, b5, rook b2, a4. This is just a sample line, of course. G3, remember, black's only chance and a source of counterplay is by advancing the G pawn. So King G4, Rook G8 check, King H3. Let's say King takes E5, for example, G2, and eventually um, black is going to be able to draw this position. Rook B4, E4, Rook takes A4, B6. Rook b4 and let's say king c6. And this is this, this is just because of the advanced uh, g pawn, right? Eventually, white might be up a pawn, but it seems that black will be able to create some type of um, philidor type position in some lines. I'll show you one more uh, example. Let's say he went to f5 here. This might be... White's best chance, so say king f5, rook takes a3, rook g6, and that's the purpose of of king f5. That's why I think it's the best move because it addresses, and I, I kind of set it up for you, that the way you should be thinking in chess. Remember I was telling you is that black's only source of counterplay was by advancing and protecting the g-pawn, right? Therefore, what white should have should have done was put a greater amount of effort into stopping the uh, counterplay from black which was the g-pawn that's why this variation king f5 dresses that straight away once the g-pawn is gone white has the um ability to concentrate elsewhere on the board however it's still not easy because of the rules of chess so for example in this line it seems that um, black might still be able to draw this position but I still think this is probably uh, black's uh, uh, excuse me, White's best chance as far as a as, uh, practical uh, win. So some of you could even take this position and uh, put it on the uh, table basis, right? There's, uh, yeah, there's enough pieces here and see what you think. Another idea after Rook A2, again, Rook C1 was played during the game by Kasparov, is uh, finally, I'll look at is this move... Um, Again, just b5, right? Rook takes b6. Again, the pawn is going to run down the board if it can. g3, rook g8, and king f7. Rook takes, rook b5, king f4, rook takes b6. And here, black can draw. Black can just simp uh, set up a fill door position. You already see the rook on the third rank here. And, um,. There's many ways a black king could go. The black king could even go to the 8th rank at this point and still uh, draw the game. If you're not familiar with the Philidor position in the end game, just go on my uh, my uh, channel, check the uh, playlist. And uh, there's many videos of end games, but just look up Philidor's uh, ending, explain, and you'll see that. But this black will be able to uh, draw this. So... Although it looked very, um, I'm not going to say very easy, but it looked kind of straightforward with these two passers, right? Um, even uh, young Gary Kasparov wasn't able to beat Larson in this uh, ending. 
So good game by both players. Good attack. Interesting game. Um, good good defense. Uh, by uh Bet Larson. So that was in Tilburg, 1981. We're gonna step in the time machine, and now we're gonna get back out of the time machine one year later in uh Bogonio, 1982. So the players meet again, same opening, and you know some analysis is taking place, especially on Kasparov's uh side of things. Right, being young, hungry, and right here he's probably ranked number one. Uh, I'm sorry, number two in the world at the time, right? So. Here's Kesparov uh, entering into his prime pretty much. Same opening by Larson. Kesparov meets the challenge. Again, old Indian defense. Both sides, Castle, King side. And so we see instead of uh, Gary with the aggressive play as we saw in the first game, he switches it up, plays in a more classical uh uh, sense right so we see like a traditional king's indian um attack against uh black d5 and knight c5 so again the onus is on black to justify uh allowing white this space advantage in the center if he's not able to uh do anything about this or uh tear down this center uh white will have an advantage so this is the purpose behind uh, most of these moves in the opening you see these attacks on e4 for instance with the knight on f6 c5 the pawn on c6 um, It all creates tension right because black just doesn't want to capture and uh, Allow white to solidify uh, His center right and sometimes black uh, white doesn't want to capture because he doesn't want to give up the, the uh, squares they, right, that he's gained the control that he's gained. So you can see the battle of these ideas as the game continues. So queen c2, this fortifies the center, and now c takes d5, c takes d5. So black makes a committal move. He decides that okay, he's gonna fix the pawns here. So this, um, in one sense, is good for good for white because he is no more pressure. Um, uh, in that part of the board, right, he has those two central pawns, but black has the C file open, right, and he plans on attacking the center, right, he, he's never going to give up the attack in the center, but now he's going to organize his attack to where eventually he gets F5, and because you got to remember, this and this is, right, if we, if we could zoom in and just focus on that, the center, that is an advantage to white, right? Having more space in the center. N all other things being equal, right? Um, you know, let me let me get that across. All other things being equal, that is a static advantage for white. So, although other moves are being played and there's plans, that is very important for black to try to tear that down or at least compromise it, right, throughout the game. So, let's continue. So, queen c7. So he gets the C file open, but he still has work to do in the center. Knight D2. You can see Kasparov um, defending. Bishop D7. A4. And now Rook C8. And A4 is an interesting move because you see it in other openings like the Benoni and such. Benoni, um, well, different variations of the Benoni, but... The idea, and I think in some lines of the Grunfeld, uh, but the idea is that you see the bishop is here, queen is here on c2, knight is here. It's hard to get this guy in the game, right? The center is blocked for a while, so a4, not only does it gain space on the queen side, but it plans on lifting the rook to the third rank. Hey, some lines. So that's an idea that you can remember. Kasparov played rook a3, of course. Knight e8. What's going on with knight e8? Hey, black still has to continue working to tear the, the center down, right? So idea is f5. So queen d1. Bishop g5. Good idea. Uh, by Larson because this bishop, this bishop is bad and uh, a lot of these a lot of these Indian defenses right this bishop usually is stuck behind a uh, uh, 
pawns on the dark squares. And you see the same idea in the check Bononi. Bishop comes to g5. Right? Where you can um, get rid of the bishop. B4. That's the second I idea behind this rook lift. Not only to get the rook into play, but also protect this knight. So you can play the move B4 to get rid of get rid of uh, this knight. So B4 and knight A6. And what that does is it's good for white because it takes pressure off the center. Because the knight is no longer here. It's in the corner. It takes pressure off the center. So after queen B3. F5. So, although f5 is played there, it doesn't have as strong of an effect with the knight on a6, adding to the pressure. But notice how Kasparov's knights are already prepared to defend here. Knight c4. Bishop takes c1. Rook takes c1. F takes e4 by Larson. Knight takes e4 by Larson. So you can see how he's been chipping away at the center. Yeah, the game's been going on, but he's never lost sight of this of the center bishop f5 knight g3 matter of fact i want to take you back and show you something real quick so i'm just going to go back to remember where larson played bishop g5 to trade off this bishop now with the knight here he could have played f5 here he takes Bishop takes f5. This is, again, good for black. So just give me an idea of what's going on. Now, some of you are saying, hey, what about f3? Can he just uh, strengthen uh, his center? Yes, he, you know, as President uh, Obama would say, yes, he can. But um, <laughs> after f3, then you play a move like bishop g5. Okay. You see, putting that pressure. Getting rid of that knight there puts pressure uh, on this on the center. So back to the game. So bishop g5 was played, and eventually, I'm sorry, eventually, and then f5 was played later. But again, it's not as effective as it was a few moves ago because remember the knight was here and influencing the center. So knight c4. Takes, rook takes, f takes e4, knight takes e4, bishop f5, knight g3, queen d7. Perhaps um, black would like to preserve the bishop, but he doesn't have a lot of time. And he needs to get off the uh, c file because the rook is on c1. So he's just basically killing two birds with one stone. He's like, all right, you could take the bishop, but I'm getting my queen out of there. So queen d7. H3 from Kasparov. And this gives, this is sort, sort of a waste of time here. It kind of gives uh, Larson time to, like, you know, regroup his pieces a little bit. Knight F6. Again, I keep reiterating this, but notice, again, pressure on pressure on the center, right? See, because a lot of people, for uh, when I say a lot of people, I do mean a lot of people. A lot of new players... Uh, below 1800 1900 even uh, maybe even below like expert uh 2000 will fight for the will concentrate on the center only in the opening of the game at the beginning you know in the opening of first 10 moves they're thinking about the center like you have to be thinking about the center like throughout the game the center is prime real estate right the center is prime real estate uh no matter if it's the beginning of the game or it's it's in the middle game toward the end the center is prime real estate what do you do in the end game what do they tell you right in the in the ending the, bring your king towards where toward the center right the center doesn't lose its value as the game goes on the get the, the center has the same value that that it had but in the beginning but it's like new i noticed like newer players They'll lose focus 
right? The, because they're used to copying openings. They don't understand that the openings are, are all geared around playing for the center in some way or the other. So after they finish copying the opening, then they just, they don't have to understand and then they just play whatever comes to, to their heads. But you can see Larson is move 21, still playing with the center in mind. Knight f6, rook a, a1. Now did Kasparov just, uh, did Kasparov just forget about the center, right, by playing rook a, a1? Right? Did he just drop a pawn? Right? Let's see what happens. If knight takes d5, then the game will be over. It's the knight e3. Yeah, it's a double attack on the bishop here. You have this double double attack on the bishop. And the knight is pinned, unfortunately. So, of course, bishop e6 to deal with that. But then, rook takes. Right, make it nice and clean. Rook takes. And then just simply knight takes d5 uh, wins. So, rook a, a1. Bishop g6. Why bishop g6? Not only does he preserve the bishop, but he still can still fight for the, fight for the center. Right with a move like Bishop F uh, F seven, of course Kasparov is going to defend, but those are the ideas in motion. Right, this would add to the pressure on the center, or prepare the capture here on the center. This is why you see the next move. Ninety three, because now the center is actually in danger of being captured. Either ninety three or bishop f three could have been played with the same idea of protecting uh, d five. So ninety three, rook takes c one, rook takes c one, rook c c eight. So the game um, is, for all intents and purposes, uh, uh, equal here. Um, the reason is is because Black has done a good job defending. Right, his pawn structure is uh, pretty good. Yeah, he has three pawn islands, but um, it's not like white can really reach uh, those weaknesses. All right. Um, and he's done a great job of countering in the center. Okay. Um, you know, with the with the knight on f6, bishops able to come to f7. Say these rooks are traded off and then this knight comes here. It's going to be a lot of pressure on this d-pawn. And it's going to be hard for white to be able to execute operations and other parts of the board with all that pressure on the center. He might have just enough to defend while black's attacking. And that will lead uh, to uh, a drawerish uh, position. Alright, so with those ideas in mind... After Rook C8 from Larson, Kasparov played a di very dynamic move here. Um, rook to C6. Love this move. And it's not, a, you know, it's not like a, a crazy difficult tactic to spot. The tactic is real simple. I mean, Rook takes. And if uh, uh, Pawn takes... You have this discovered check uh, hitting the queen here. All right. So that's not that's not a, a big mystery. Just I want to show you that if, you know, the idea that I was just explaining about the center and this protection and the attack that black is trying to um, wage against it. So, for example, Kis say if Kisparov plays, sorry, rook takes c8 check. Game could go, queen takes c8, bishop c4, right, uh, protecting the center. I like to move knight c7, again, putting more pressure on the center, and also I'm going to play bishop f7 in the future. Queen a3, why queen a3? Because this pawn is hanging right here, my idea is just simply to play b5. So, queen d7, protecting that pawn, b5. Now, bishop f7, so now black has three pieces against his pawn. Knight g f5, again another attack here. So, 
knight c e8 protects the pawn and now i want to play something like oops i want to play something like g6 to kick this knight out let's say queen b4 keeping the pressure there g6 and what do you play knight h6 check king g7 get rid of the bishop and you know the game is uh pretty drawish there but the point that i'm making the point that i'm trying to make is that the center is all always important it's always uh uh value valuable here and as you can see the pieces like will slowly get traded down you know perhaps this knight ends up back here again and white would kind of be tied down to the defense and black would be attacking and that's why the position will be uh, dynamically balanced so Kasparov avoids that he plays this move rook c6 and um larson actually took so he fell for the okie doke as i like to call it and you might say well how's he falling for anything after all he'll just be able to play queen to um you know f7 right I'll give up the exchange here with this knight but then he'll just move his uh his um his, his queen out of the way so what happened in the game after b takes c6 D takes e6, check, right, discover, check. He did play that. Queen f7. All right. But, as we all thought, bishop c4. D5. Knight takes d5. He slid his king over. Played king h8. So, basically, Larson tried to steal the rook here. But, knight b6, discovery. And now knight takes c8 from Kasparov. Queen takes c8. And now b5. So Larson uh, calculated correctly, right? That he would not be he would not uh, be down material as far as like the the exchange or anything like that. But he misevaluated this uh, position at the end because you can see that Kasparov is just simply up two pawns and clearly winning. Right, you had three to one uh, queen side majority. If if Larson saw anything that looked like this, obviously he would um, he have rejected the position. Now on one end, the beautiful thing is that Black center is uh, looks looks excellent. Right, he has a pawn on e e five. Is just what he wanted. He's finally uh, got the victory there. However. You have to watch the other sectors of the board too. And on the queen side, he is busted. More busted uh, than ever. Again, continue. Knight c5. And right here, uh, um, Kasparov just did his job. He's a top grandmaster. Queen e7. Knight takes g3. Um, Kasparov didn't even bother to um, <laughs> capture the knight. Let's play c7. Bishop f5. Now he captures the knight. A few more moves. And we can see how this story ends. Kasparov played queen c5. And of course, um, Larson uh, resigned uh, here. Now let me go back to the scene of the crime. So here, Kasparov is kind of gambling here. He plays rook c6. Now, it's not a bad move. It's not like he's going to lose. Um, like the move wasn't sound. I don't want you to think that. The move was, was perfectly sound. But he had a choice. He could have just went into the ending I, I told you about. Rook takes c8. Right? Which would have been very clear to Larson. Or played the move he played. Rook c6. Right? Which is still uh, equal. But get you know you know gives a little bit you know confusion because it's just a, it's kind of like a surprising move it's like what the heck is going on somebody plays a move like this and it absolutely worked uh on larson here so after um rook c6 the correct move here actually there's a couple of moves that were good rook f8 of course but the better move is just knight just simply knight c7 again Put in the attack on the center. Okay. Center is very important. The rook now has no choice but to to uh, retreat. 
to say like rook c3 or something like that okay so like for example rook c3 I see e8. So of course offering the, the rook trade again. You know, who knows? Let's say uh let's say rook takes e8, queen takes e8. And the position becomes like the uh becomes analogous to the one I had just showed you before with all the, the variations, right? Queen D seven, black white wants to play B five, etc. And uh all of those things like that. But black is gonna, you know, play knight C seven eventually. You know, bishop here and gang up on this pawn, and that's gonna be enough to keep uh white tied down uh to the uh defense. Right? So the game would definitely have been equal after this uh, move knight c7 so why larson didn't see that um i'm sure he saw it but his personality caused him to uh reject the idea so anyway that is it uh for today's video i hope you enjoyed those two uh games between gary kasparov and the great danish player bent larson who at one time uh was considered the second best player in the west guess who the first first one was that was Bobby Fisher so then of course at the Bobby Fisher left the scene Bent Larson was the man he was the best well uh, player in the West and then after him it was Jan Timmon so there's a little chess, chess trivia there for you so I hope you enjoyed that video I hope you learned something hit all those buttons right except the thumbs down button hit the like button the subscribe button type some comments in the bottom, even if the comments are just like A, 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 B, 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 let me know that you're out there. If somebody ran into uh, some good chess content. And um, please check the links below. I always put post videos and DVDs related content uh, to what you just saw uh, on the actual chess board. And also, please donate to my channel if the videos help um, help your, um, you know, your chess or you just enjoy them in general. That would be greatly appreciated. Okay, I look forward to hearing from all of you guys, and I'll see you soon on the next video.